uh, we can get started um, if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, take us through. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I've already given a little bit of a background, but I thought I would um, pause on this slide for a minute. Uh, so I've, who am I? Uh, I've been doing computers and abusing computers, you know, for most of my life. I had a 300 baud modem and a Commodore 64, right, back in the 80s in high school. Pretty much, you know, your story of, of like Matthew Broderick in, in uh, war games, uh, being a hacker and bulletin board type uh, person. Uh, but my hobby became my career eventually. And uh, so I wrote a uh, book uh, for Cisco Press for a certification that doesn't exist anymore uh, back in 2002. Um, I gave birth uh, to the website of Starbucks, its very first website back in 1998, working in San Francisco during the dot-com rise and fall. I ran the DevOps team at a company called Organic Online, which is one of the first web design houses. It was there I also ran the team that gave birth to PlayStation.com for the PS2 uh, and Macy's and uh, what else? Um, Blockbuster. If only they had known that Be Kind Rewind was not uh, going to last and they should have transitioned to streaming uh, sooner. Uh, and of course, I built banks uh, when I lived and worked in Europe for 11 years. I designed and built and supported Rabobanks, Direct Banks. Um, I built their trading floor in Utrecht, uh, which is a once in 30 years kind of architecture project. Uh, really a great feather in my cap. Um, ING's uh, DR infrastructure uh, was also a project that I was a lead on. Uh, and then I moved back to the US and ran the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, Enterprise Server Platform about 10,000 servers and a quadrillion dollars in contracts traded uh, back in 2013, 2014. And um, then after the CME, I made a transition uh, into um, yeah, entertainment. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks are curious to hear some of my stories about being head of security at Marvel for two years, where I like to joke, it was my job to keep Iron Man safe. And uh, that was as cool a job as you can imagine. Walk in the office, everyone's reading comics and watching movies, and that was their job, and it was my job to keep them safe. I was actually the head of DevOps, Enterprise Architecture, and InfoSec, uh, and so really great um, uh, opportunity working for the Empire, uh, given that uh, you know, Disney bought Marvel in 2009. Lots of great stories to tell you know, about um, working there, and I'll try to pepper some of them into this presentation. After Marvel, I was the CISO at ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. Uh, I'm an ASCAP member. I'm a musician. I'm a jazz musician and ASCAP is a really great uh, mission-based organization. Uh, it pays the royalties for people that write the songs, right? Not the folks that were sort of extracting value from the music system for the streaming rights or mechanical rights, as it's called in the business, um, like Spotify. Those are the recording rights, right? That's a little different. And so ASCAP has, um, for example, as its chair of uh, the board is... Um, um, Paul Williams, and he wrote the Rainbow Connection for the Muppet movie. And so you can't imagine a more warm and fuzzy clientele to try to protect. And we had about 800,000 members uh, and $1.2 billion in revenue, uh, distributing $1.1 billion to the members. So a very lean and mean organization. Uh, and then uh, uh, it was... Uh, CISO at Security Scorecard for two years, and I've now transitioned to being an advisor for the company and uh, just started working uh, as a uh, CISO for a healthcare startup. And so I'm doing new things, um, spreading myself a little more thin uh, and not dedicating all of my time and attention to just one company these days. So I'm doing some of the virtual CISO work as well. And then lastly, the World Economic Forum. I was nominated as a technology pioneer in 2020 when I joined Scorecard. And most recently, I was working on working groups in the oil and gas industry. Uh, but the really sexy working group to be on, which I had to interview uh, to be on, uh, is the Quantum Security Working Group, uh, which has such luminaries as Tahir El Gamal and Bruce Schneier uh, on the committee. So really excited to, to uh, contribute to some of those efforts, uh, as well as um, you know being an NYU professor, uh, teaching cybersecurity, uh, graduate students, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, so enough about me. Uh, summary. Talking to the board is the easy part. Adding value to their thinking is what is hard. So this is a quote from Bob Lord, who has been through many breaches. Um, I remember at RSA in 2019, he spoke about a presentation for the CISO Summit, uh, where I was there uh, presenting as well. He was talking about how to put a breach on your resume and live the tale of the tale. Uh, so Bob's been through a lot. He was like a you know, Democratic National Committee you know, CISO, 
when it was breached. Um, and I think he was also at Yahoo when it was breached. Um, but anyway, he's the technical advisor now at CISA um, or CISA. And uh, the question is, of course, what value can InfoSec add to the board's thinking about risk? And I like to think it's much more than just making sure we don't get hacked, right? That's just much too simple of a challenge or a mandate. It's everyone's job to do security, not just the CISOs. Uh, so in, in this discussion of risk <clears throat> and uh, third party risk, I like as a philosopher by training, you know, computers is just my hobby, as I mentioned, uh, I like to back up and question what are the words and concepts and definitions. And so let me throw out a couple of definitions. What is risk? Um, I think it's exposure to the possibility of loss, injury, or other adverse or unwelcome circumstance. Uh, so let's talk for a minute about some of the definitions and dimensions of risk uh, in order to have a process that's documented and repeatable. I think that's what we'd call risk management. Uh, but to scale that risk management and to scale that process and automate the quantification of risk, I think that's evolving towards something we might call risk intelligence. And your typical dimensions and definitions of risk, you look at these like three by three matrix, right? Probability times impact equals risk, severity rating scale one through five, five being the most critical. But again, I don't think this cuts it to really capture what we're talking about when we're talking about risk. So I wanted to dive into some of the fundamental differences of cyber risk, as opposed to just risk management in general. And of course, third party risk in particular. So um, back in, I think it was April, I was uh, in Houston, uh, giving a presentation for the Port of the Future Conference. So we're talking here about maritime security. And in preparing for that, I wanted to bring this slide into my subsequent presentations because I love the use of you know the Lord of the Rings reference here. And so we talk about Port of the Future, we could talk about Port of the Present, Port of the Past. Well, this was the slide I put together on Port of the Mythic Past, uh, where natural features of the landscape are used to protect against threats. And so you have your traditional kinetic warfare TTPs, right? Uh, which would be, you know, having a valley and having a river and using the natural contours of the land. Here you see, for example, the Pillars of the Kings at the northern border of Gondor. And so the Argonoth, you know, uh, which is the great monument here, each of the two figures are having a crown and a helm and an ax, you know, in their hand and a gesture warning off Gondor's enemies. Unfortunately, in cyberspace, there are no natural features you know, that can be utilized in this way. Cyberspace has no natural contours as its theater of operations is entirely manufactured by network hardware and software systems. Uh, so defining cyberspace, uh, I go to William Gibson, right? The term first appeared in fiction in 1980s uh, in the work of uh, cyberpunk author William Gibson, first in his 1982 short story, Burning Chrome, and then later in 1984 in the novel Neuromancer. Uh, I think Johnny Depp, I think did a, no, not Johnny Depp, um, uh, Keanu Reeves uh, played the character, I think, in that film uh, version. Anyway, in the next few years, the word became very prominently identified, which is basically online computer networks. And Gibson quoted, you know, um, in a documentary, it was a 2000 uh, documentary uh, called No Maps for These Territories. And I quote, all I knew about the word cyberspace when I coined it was that it seemed like an effective buzzword. It seemed evocative and essentially meaningless. It was suggestive of something, but had no real semantic meaning, even for me, as I saw it emerge on the page. So what's different about cyberspace and what are some of the dimensions? I like to think about there being three dimensions. And I start with physical, and then I go into informational, and then cognitive. Now, in this case, I'm collapsing hardware and software and virtual and physical into just the physical. Why? Well, because all software needs to run on some hardware somewhere, right? And so really, it just doesn't make sense to have that extra dimension. Uh, an interesting way, though, of describing cyberspace is to ask yourself the question, where are you when you're on the phone? Uh, shown here is a frame uh, showing hyperbolic space tiled with rhombic dodecahedra from a 1980 film entitled Not Not, uh, which is about advanced mathematics and tiling hyperbolic space or Lobachevsky in space um, with uh, these similar type uh, objects. It's a really cool short film. I have a link to it in the slides, which I can give anyone that wants to have a copy of them uh, with the link uh, to a YouTube of this video where you're flying around in hyperbolic space. And I think that that's kind of what hyperspace is, right? It's not really and the internet. It's not really 
really bounded by geography in the same ways as, as you know, real life. Uh, so the first dimension, of course, is just technical infrastructure, hardware, software, anything within the electromagnetic spectrum, essentially, that enables the flow of information between producers of information, consumers of information, audiences, and of course, the systems that build this network. Uh, so this is land, sea, air, and space, of course. You know, there's, there's Linux vulnerabilities on Mars now, right, with um, Linux systems being launched with rovers. Uh, so that's basically the physical dimension. We're all pretty familiar with that. Uh, the informational dimension, this is basically data, right, at rest or in transit. And here we're referred to, you know, I guess data, you could also talk about knowledge and, and information as well at rest. Um, so this includes machine readable content, numbers, text, audio, pictures, video, but it's also in this dimension where a cyber persona resides. So think of digital representations of individuals or other entities uh, that use cyberspace and have one or more identities that can be identified, attributed, and acted upon. I myself have a special nom de plume or an alias that I use whenever I log into a website to download a white paper, for example. I don't use my real credentials and information. And I imagine most security professionals have more than one identity. Um, certainly people are using it for research um, in other areas as well. And so this is, uh, again, all this sort of lives in the informational space. But the dimension that we often, I think, don't spend enough time thinking about is this cognitive dimension. Um, knowledge, beliefs, values, concepts, uh, and perceptions of individuals and groups. So it's these actors, you know, um, that are the creators and users of the content that moves through the physical layer. This dimension, the cognitive, this provides the societal, cultural, religious, and historical context that influences the perceptions of those producing the content and those consuming it. So think of governments, criminals, activists, and hackers. We all think, perceive, visualize, and understand, and we decide within this cognitive dimension. And I think there's a lot of cognitive risk going on, and I want to bring up a couple of them. So some of the dimensions of risk, I have four more ways of slicing the world of risk. And this is not something that I learned somewhere. I kind of came up with it on my own as I was musing about this topic. Attestation, awareness, trust, and management. So the attestation dimension. Uh, if Colonial Pipeline had performed a self-assessment in 2020 prior to their breach and to their ransomware event, what would have changed, All right? Because there were people in Congress that were banging on the table saying, how come you didn't do a self-assessment? And of course, I don't think anything would have changed, right? They would have asserted that they had all the appropriate controls in place to mitigate ransomware, uh, but they were wrong, of course, right? We need tools that can validate these assertions of compliance and to do it in a continuous and automated manner, not in the annual sending out a questionnaire. If you send Okta a questionnaire on December 14th and say, hey, Okta, have you been breached in the last 12 months? Because they're your vendor for SSO, maybe. Uh, they reply back to that questionnaire and say, yeah, we were breached back in January. Didn't read about it. You know, lapses. It was on the news. You know, And then that's like your shields up moment. Well, that's a bit late, right? Because it's like 12 months after the event almost. Uh, so I think it's important to think of not in time terms of point in time assessments of risk and assertions and attestations of posture, but to be able to do this in a continuous, you know, um, automated uh, scanning, continuous monitoring, essentially. Uh, the awareness dimension, uh, I think it, it's, it's interesting to think about, like, who can afford to scan and monitor all of your vendor APIs, all of their websites, all of their X509 certificate expirations, applications, and services? Uh, security ratings companies like Security Scorecard, they do that, right? Other companies help you do this as well. And so it's useful to have that be a centralized function so that you're not paying Tenable or Qualys or Rapid7 to scan all of IPv4 in order to gain awareness of all the assets that are out there. Because there's a serious discovery function that happens when you're scanning the internet. Normally, when you do a pen test, you say, let's scan this range of IPs because these are our critical assets. But what about the assets you don't know about, right? The rogue uh, assets that have been stood up or the forgotten assets. And so I think the awareness function of, of risk is a big piece of, of what's interesting about automating and scaling. Uh, and of course, trust. If zero trust architecture means never trust, always verify, well, for what values of always are gonna be practical? 
do we simply insert three factor authentication, four factor authentication, ad infinitum? So we're suddenly talking about 100 factor auth, right? We can't really rely on simple additive layers of authentication. Otherwise, you're going to end up with, like I said, 100, 100 FA one day. So I think we need new mechanisms for establishing trust coupled with transparency and accountability. I think it was Saturday Night Live that had a skit, right? It feels like inflation. Uh, the Saturday Night Live Saturday Night Live skit was about um, razors, disposable razors. You had one blade, two blade, three blade. And of course, back when this first happened, they made a skit uh, about like a five blade razor or something. And of course, we actually probably have them for sale now. And so that's just not a way of radically approaching this problem and solving it. We have to get away from these sort of additive measures of, of telemetry. Uh, and then lastly, the management dimension of, of risk. Uh, I think you might remember the uh, Ever Given, right? This was the super tanker in the Suez Canal that lodged itself sideways um, in March uh, of, what was it, 2021, I think, um, for six days, right? How many markets were affected by just that one event? So the so supply chain is not just about one degree neighbors upstream and downstream and your relationships of goods and services, whether they be digital or physical. It needs to be about the entire ecosystem. And so it's not just a link of three, right? A chain of three links. You, your one link upstream and your one link downstream. And so I really wanna zoom out and talk about you know, ecosystem risk as well. And so if we think about third-party risk, which is the title for this talk, Third-party risk makes sense, but let's remind ourselves what first-party, second-party, and potentially fourth, fifth, and sixth-party risk is. And so here, I just wanted to throw those four dimensions out and just mention a little bit about each. So in first-party, you have self-attestation. You have complete internal awareness, or at least you should, of all of your assets. And you manifest your control you know, um, trust is manifested through control, right? You should have one neck to throttle, right? If you own your own data center uh, on-prem and it's your first party infrastructure and you're managing and patching it or not, right? And then enterprise risk management is the domain of the risk management uh, dimension. Second party is, is your customers, right? So you have customer attestation here for uh, the attestation piece. You have firsthand partial awareness, meaning your customers experience the services that you expose to them, uh, like doing a money order or a wire transfer, buying a book or starting to stream a film. Uh, so they have partial awareness of your failures, especially if they get errors when they're trying to transact uh, those things. Uh, trust is exhibited through brand loyalty and familiarity. And of course you have contractual risk management, uh, those click through terms, right? Uh, that are a part of uh, buying services and selling services online. Third party has had a big of a heyday these last two or three years with the pandemic. Why? Because there's been a lot of really good poster children uh, out there for third party risk and supply chain attacks. Uh, Kaseya, uh, SolarWinds, um, uh, Okta, right? There's just no end of them actually, uh, it seems, uh, to breaches that are caused by attacking the weakest link. Uh, in third party, it's external attestation, incomplete awareness, um, because you don't know everything that's happening in your third parties. Um, although scanning can help with some of that. Uh, you have trust exhibited through impartiality. And here what I mean is when we want to do a third party pen test, we pick a third party because they should be unbiased. They shouldn't know which areas to not test because they might fall over, right? An internal team might unconsciously shy away from something that they know is vulnerable. And they can also just sort of randomly test things that you wouldn't even think of testing. Uh, think of like evil QA, right? Where they're trying to do session hijacking and things like that. So you have bug bounty programs that are third-party impartiality. Uh, you have um, uh, third-party testing, pen tests, you know, uh, red team exercises. And of course, vendor risk management, VRM. This has been the sweet spot for tools like, you know, score, security ratings uh, to be able to instantly get a score for a company and to know if you're trying to shortlist, you know, four or five vendors down to two or three uh, to do a POC. Uh, it's easy to pick the one that has an A over the one that has a D or an F, you know, for example. And so I think vendor risk management has a natural affinity for, you know, scaling of third-party risk. Uh, we have some customers at Scorecard, for example, that have like 40,000 vendors in a portfolio and they don't need a 300 vendor risk management team right 300 head count to do that right sending out questionnaires once a year it would take you forever to send out 40,000 questionnaires and get all those back so you need a more automated scaled way of doing this and of course your third parties they have vendors too and that's your nth party risk or fourth party fifth party sixth party in this case you have peer attestation so think of um, Yelp, 
um, kind of reviews, right? And uh, other types of crowdsourced information. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, Better Business Bureau, right? All of this stuff comes through that kind of peer attestation and reputation in the market. Uh, you have very minimal awareness of what's happening on that infrastructure. Uh, and your trust essentially is via proxy. You're trusting this fourth party because your third party chose them. And of course, there's ecosystem risk management. My favorite example here is when US East goes down, which it seems to every year or so these days, uh, due to some mistake. Uh, Max Threads was one time. Uh, another time was uh, um, just someone fat fingering a release uh, for um, uh, S3, and that brought down all of S3 and US East. That's when a lot of people learn what the definition of concentration risk means. So you might have a fault tolerant multi availability zone, multi region design, but one of your third or fourth parties may not. And so if all their eggs are in one basket, like DNS services, for example, and that's the thing that goes down, then suddenly you realize that you did have a single point of failure. It was your nth or third party upstream providers. And so that's really why I want us to think more about the entire ecosystem of risk and how to handle scanning a thousand or more you know, um, vendors, uh, not because they're all core tier one you know, vendors, uh, but because you know, they can be impactful to you uh, if they go down. Um, anyway, so next up, uh, dimensions of risk. Um, I think the biggest risk is the cognitive risk of a lack of understanding of cyber risk at the board level, at the executive level. And this is something I've been evangelizing for the last year or two now with some of my talks like this one. I think it's, it's some of the risks that we don't even think about addressing, right? Because they're so deep seated or they feel insurmountable or, or too improbable. And so I show you know, a diagram of the Death Star here, for example, uh, design flaw if you saw Rogue, Rogue One that was intentionally created. But anyway, uh, I think the space shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986 is a really good example of cognitive risk. There was a culture of launch as a go, and this culture managed to keep engineers who knew that the O-rings were subject to cold temperatures overnight from stopping the launch. So management failed, not for a lack of knowledge, technique, or control of systems engineering, but they failed for a belief. Some engineers, uh, Bob Ebeling, for example, he was one of the uh, Morton Thicol uh, booster, five booster rocket engineers. Uh, he tried to bring this fact to light prior to launch, uh, but uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, another cognitive risk, uh, I believe, is prevention bias. And I think about this as a tendency in cybersecurity to focus on preventative measures at the expense of thinking about or investing in detection and response, due in part to beliefs and feelings rather than facts. Uh, so it could just be that we've all just internalized the meme that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, but a recent review of IT and OT standards, regulations and best practices by dragos.com, uh, a really excellent organization if you haven't heard of them. Uh, Rob Lee is the uh, founder and CTO. I met him through the World Economic Forum because he's also in the same working group in the oil and gas industry. Uh, brilliant, brilliant person, uh, really enjoy the, uh, contrarian thinking that he's capable of. He's former NSA and he's just killing it. Dragos is all over the place these days uh, in good ways. Uh, but anyway, they, they did a, a blog post uh, recently um, that we've actually managed to codify a prevention bias into our compliance frameworks. They calculated that 75% of controls across various frameworks are all focused on prevention which only leaves about 25% of our mind share and potentially our budget for detection, response, and recovery. Now, it was Benjamin Franklin who coined the timeless phrase, you know, ounce of prevention is equal to a pound of cure. And this is essentially an early meme from the year 1736 uh, in order to remind the citizens of Philadelphia to remain vigilant about fire awareness and prevention. But it was not meant to keep them from knowing how to detect a fire and how to quickly put it out. And I think that's where we're in trouble right now. Um, so I have a reference here to uh, the Dragos uh, blog post talking about uh, prevention bias and incident response. And um, yes, I do think there is a prevention bias. Uh, two other references, um, two of the working papers, two of the white papers that I worked on uh, for the last couple of years at the WEF um, are principles of board governance and cyber risk in the oil and gas industry. But these six principles, they're modern principles for governance. Uh, they apply to all industries and sectors, not just oil and gas. <coughs> and then of course, my favorite example is the white paper from uh, I believe it was what um, looking here from August of, of last year uh, is is um, case studies, right? 
actual advancing supply chain security with case studies. So I wrote one of the seven case studies along with folks from Saudi Aramco, Royal Dutch Shell, Siemens Corporation, Schneider Electric, and CISA, and Dragos, and others. And so this is a really good real world example of what people are doing to bring those six modern principles of governance into um, a working functioning uh, part of your roadmap and your plan and your governance. Because uh, again, it's the governance layer is moving too slow and not keeping up. The rest of the org charts, I think doing their job, innovating and trying new things and trying to solve risk you know, in new ways. Uh, anyway, so links to both of those uh, white papers are in the uh, slide uh, notes, which I'll give you a, a copy of um, should you ask for it. Uh, then uh, this brings me to the third sort of push or you know, link that I want to promote, which is this unified taxonomy of continuous monitoring. So if you're familiar with SIG Lite, SIG Full, right, that's um, shared um, uh, uh, in, what is it, information gathering, you know, these templates that we use that we send around all these questionnaires for. But anyway, we worked with all of our competitors, meaning um, uh, Risk Recon, BitSight, Pan arrays, black kite, and security scorecard to come up with a, a harmonized taxonomy. So that we're all talking about the same thing. And so shared assessments publish that. And there's two links. One of them is the white paper, and then another is a webinar explaining the taxonomy, uh, where we all talk about how we came together, put aside our little differences, you know, you know as competitors, and leveled up the whole space. Um, because if if my example here would be the morning star and the evening star, right? They're both the planet Venus. It just depends when you look at them. Uh, and so we shouldn't be using different words for things. And so I really like the idea and I invested a lot of time as a philosopher. It was really fun for me actually to try to come up with language right, and a taxonomy that worked for the description of all continuous monitoring and how we use that for business intelligence uh, across these different products and tools. Uh, so for me, continuous monitoring is the jam. That's the thing. You can't just do point in time annual assessments. And I like to quote, Heraclitus, this ancient Greek philosopher and historian, who said something that roughly translates to, you can never step into the same river twice. And for me, this is awesome because it's not AI or machine learning hype, right? This is what I call original gangsta infosec, um, because I think the river analogy works really well for information security. Some folks want to sit in an inner tube with a six pack of beer and float lazily along the winding oxbow of the river of life. Others want to strap on a helmet and head straight to the class five rapids in order to get to the next stretch of their digital journey, whether that's moving to the cloud or figuring out how to turn your clouds into cloud, you know, like elastic aware uh, and not just be lift and shift um, cloud uh, deployments. And so I think this is a, a good analogy, like I said, to talk about where are you in this world? You know, it's a different person, according to Heraclitus, for it's not the same river and it's not the same man. So if you take away the um, you know, pronouns uh, 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 in the bias of the translation originally, um, it is important to realize that we're not the same CISOs that we were or security officers or professionals that we were two or three years ago. The world has changed, right? The flow of the river has changed, you know, the color and the sound of it have changed. And so we need to acknowledge the fact that we need continuous monitoring. Um, a couple of folks are starting to do that. Uh, continuous monitoring by regulatory bellwether agencies like NIST, um, NYDFS and CSBS have all come out recently and saying, you need to perform outside in analysis we need to use data right from third party assessments and ratings platforms, just like we've done in financial services with credit ratings. Well, the same thing should become standard and transparent and ubiquitous uh, for security ratings. Why? Because you can always borrow more money, but it takes a while to get your reputation back. <clears throat> and of course, NYDFS um, was a real leader in 2017, uh, embracing some cybersecurity reg regulations ahead of the curve. And they've done the same thing now in 2022 by declaring their love for security ratings. And then CSBS is in the same boat. Uh, again, links to their endorsements of this as a part of a good and well-run security program. Uh, a couple of self-scoring examples. Since I worked in, in Holland and built uh, the Rabobank Direct Banks, I wanted to give an example of a sort of complicated solution, right? Where you have multiple group companies, each with their own infrastructure, each with their own security team and risk profile. And a lot of times you'd think that like Rabobank International would be the parent company, but it's not. It's actually a peer or a sister of Rabobank, Belgium, Netherlands, UK, Australia, New Zealand. And then of course the Netherlands has sub companies, Robeco and Nidropolis, right? And so how do you do a risk score for the Rabobank group. 
right? Well, in this case, you create a portfolio with each of the group companies in it, and then you have aggregate metrics across the portfolio. Uh, so when I lived and worked and built, you know, Rabobank's trading floor, um, I was very familiar with, you know, the problem that not all of the group companies actually have a dedicated security team. And so we needed to find ways to encourage everyone uh, to not just be a security minded person or the IT person who supports laptops suddenly being nominated as the security officer. Uh, so this is useful to allow everyone to participate in the world of, of assessing, engaging risk um, and opening up access to this information to everyone, not just people with the word security in their title. Uh, another example, would be in Asia Pacific, where you have these really complicated uh, relationships of group companies and subsidiaries. And so I think of Tokyo Marine and Nikito Fire Insurance. They have a complex set of relationships and making governance and risk management a real challenge because they can't actually set policy for some of these subsidiaries. Um, sometimes they're just group affiliates. Uh, so it was an honor for me to present um, a few sessions and webinars for Japan uh, to our customers and their customers there and talking about self-scoring and third-party risk. Because uh, in this case, you almost have to think of your group companies as third parties and not as first party uh, because of the extended relationships between them. Uh, so we gave them access to the portal you know, for free to include that in all of their um, uh, visitors for their insurance and all of their risk indicators. Uh, the example a lot of people, of course, appreciate. Um, and here you'll probably want a link to this cool graphic I found on the different companies that Disney owns. Um, Disney has four basic business segments after their consolidation several years ago, uh, each with a nested set of, of course, hundreds of companies and subsidiaries. So you have Disney Media and Entertainment, you have Parks and Experience, you have Studio, and then Direct to Consumer, DTC. And DTC was the only one that made money over the pandemic, right? Because it was Disney Plus. Everything else was shut down. There were no cruise lines, no parks, you know, there was no um, uh, events happening. And so it was really, you know, the thing that saved them uh, over the over the pandemic was the fact that they cut out the middleman or middlewoman uh, for Hulu and Netflix and went direct to consumer with Disney Plus. Uh, so anyway, this is one way uh, to embrace the ability to do risk management consistently across, you know, complex edge cases, uh, like some of these entities uh, that are involved here, uh, wholly owned or partially owned. Uh, and then uh, wrapping up, I just have a couple more slides. Um, Continuous monitoring this is the only thing that's close to me being an advisor that's kind of pitchy, and it's not really. It's just me describing the facts of this company that I've worked at and have been a customer of previously. Um, 12 million scorecards, scanning all of the internet, uh, all of IPv4, um, some cloud service I, uh, uh, IP address ranges we scan 12 times a day. And if we don't get the same attribution data back as in who owns this IP address, because you do vulnerability scans, but then you have to also do another scan to figure out attribution. Who owns the asset on the other side of that IP address? Whose scorecard should this, this vulnerability be attached to? Uh, we scan those 12 times a day. And if they don't match for 10 out of those 12 scans, we can't. Um, reliably attribute it, which is why we only have about a 1% refute rate for all of our observations. Now, when I joined the company two years ago, we were seeing 20 to 30 billion security findings in a given week. Uh, we recently had a week where we saw 180 billion security vulnerabilities. So in the space of two years, several orders of magnitude more risk. Why? Because people are making configuration mistakes. Why? Because there's more code, more vulnerabilities being disclosed. Uh, and of course, we have a sinkhole infrastructure that brings in 700 million malware events a day. We actually see command and control beaconing out to our sinkholes. And we're not, of course, telling them to ransomware or encrypt or steal the data on the other side. But it is a lot of information coming in. Anyway, so self-assessment of risk and exposure to security threats, it really can't continue at this leisurely pace of annual questionnaires and reviews of security controls and self-attestation. We really need more frequent assessments. And if we're going to have more frequent assessments of more entities for the whole supply chain, we're going to have to automate it. And in order to do that, we need hundreds of vendors, right? And the bad actors are always going to go for the weakest link. So you have to scan for all of them. Even somebody that only prints your logo on a pen could be a risk, right? Because they send you an invoice. That invoice is a PDF. That PDF could have malware, right? So you have to think about being able to be inclusive of all of your attack vectors. And so we need new tools and techniques for doing this and to effectively operate governance and compliance programs informed by a more modern approach, continuous monitoring. Uh, so what is a, an event-based assessment? What is, you know, instead of doing periodic or annual assessments, 
you just assess the ones that have um, a score drop or that have a breach event uh, or that are starting to trend uh, like we saw with um, common spirit um, health system that was breached recently they had a declining patching cadence you know in the months leading up to their breach we see this a lot in in a lot of these examples uh, so there's a particularly powerful combination of security assessments and continuous monitoring that i like to call event-based assessments and so if someone has an a you don't have to send them the, the digital equivalent of a colonoscopy survey questionnaire with a thousand questions. You know they have an A, you're continuously monitoring them on a daily basis through a ratings platform potentially. And so therefore you don't have to invest your time and attention into wondering whether their security has changed or their posture. So this allows for immediate reassessment of vendors when one of these events happens, right? Like a score drop or um, a particular CVE showing up like um, port 3389 open to the internet. That was one of the vulnerabilities we saw on Colonial Pipeline prior to them getting hit. And it turns out that was their nomination system which figured out how they did billing. They didn't shut down the pipeline because of they were worried about the pipeline itself getting compromised. They shut it down because they just couldn't figure out who, how much to charge people. Uh, so it was kind of selfish um, that they did it that way because there was actually a lot of loss of life um, due to the impact of that cyber event. And it wasn't, like I said, due to risk to the pipeline. Um, I've spoken with people that worked uh, that um, that incident. Uh, and of course we can scale to hundreds of thousands of, of customers and vendors in supply chain this way. Uh, there's uh, in cyber insurance companies that are using ratings uh, to be able to do what's called continuous underwriting and to be able to figure out what the, again, just sending out that questionnaire once a year is not adequate. So score drop events, breach events, you know, you need to know about them when they happen. And no one has the ability to do all this, you know, in isolation. Why not use a platform to do it for you? Uh, and then, of course, tailing your assessment and what kind of questionnaire you send out related to, um, you know, send a PCI assessment to your payment card providers, send a SIG, you know, full maybe to your core vendors or a SIG light to your non-core vendors. And of course, you can maintain really small VRM teams this way. Uh, here's a photo of what I believe to be a Geiger counter from Chernobyl. Uh, so that's sort of my disaster um, imagery. Uh, and then wrapping up. Uh, event-based assessments, when you do have a shields up event, which rule was triggered, right? Do you disable vendor access? Uh, do you use a tool like a SOAR, right? A security orchestration automated response to just disable all those vendors accounts uh, uh, on your platform so they can't log in so you can't get a contagion uh, infection. Uh, and of course, which assessment to send and what are the conditions for standing down? Uh, I've already mentioned, you know, we've got customers like Intel and, and others that have 40,000 vendors that they're continuously monitoring because supply chain is a big deal for chips and parts manufacturers. It's also a big deal for companies like Nike or for, for NASA, right? Uh, and then lastly, digital forensics and incident response. What are the things you can do besides having security ratings? Make sure that you do tabletop exercises, right? The what if thinking that helps you confirm uh, certain incident response procedures, procedures are in place and accurate because resilience is not just about avoiding or fearing failure. It's about how quickly you can get back up and stand up after the attack because uh, it's not a matter of if you will be attacked. It's just a matter of when and how often you'll be breached. Um, a breach cadence as opposed to breach likelihood is a better metric. Uh, think of T-Mobile. I think they're getting breached every six months these days. Um, and think of um, FireEye, right? Very paranoid, you know, um, well-funded security organization. They got breached by APT29. Just because you have an A doesn't mean, you know, you're not going to get breached. It just means you're going to get breached a little less, um, uh, uh, you're going to get breached a little less often than the bad guys um, uh, that have weak security posture on their internet facing assets. Uh, pen testing, of course, is a really good way to find the gaps in your defenses that can be exploited. Uh, then a red team exercise is to learn exactly how the bad guys will compromise your platform infrastructure to gain you know, domain admin if you have Windows infrastructure uh, or to take over your firewall rules or to steal your data. Threat hunting, of course, is valuable to find out if you're actually currently breached and you just don't know it. Uh, it could be a low and slow play that's happening uh, or that maybe you had some near misses where you were one mitigation and one you know quarantine event away from getting ransomware. Uh, so threat hunting is always a good way to justify you know and keep your security budgets um, on par uh, with what you need them to be even in a down economy. Uh, then ransomware um, right boom is when the shit hits, hits the fan when an event happens. You want to have an incident response retainer in place ahead of time. Uh, so that you don't have to go to legal and start signing contracts while your you know, head is, is in the middle of a vice uh, because there's an active breach event uh, running. Or 
if you have two prior one incidents happening at the same time, how do you stop um, that? Do you have the capacity, even if you have an internal incident response team, how do you handle two incidents at once? And so I think it always makes sense, you know, and especially if you're going to have a potential criminal prosecution, you want to engage an outside digital forensics uh, uh, firm to do it, like Mandiant or SecureWorks or whoever, uh, to be able to give you this uh, attorney-client privilege on discovery for those assets, uh, as well as the ability to just have additional capacity on demand. Uh, so these are what I would call active defense engagements. Uh, and these are capabilities that would be opposed to passive defense, right? Where we're just sitting around wringing our hands saying, oh my God, I hope we don't get attacked there. Oh my God, I hope that, you know, pager alert that just went off uh, isn't, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, lighting up a war room saying that, you know, that we have to, you know, lose um, our holiday weekend to some new exploit like Log4j uh, or other types of, um, you know, vulnerabilities that appear. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in summary, how do we address the last quartile of risk? If risk is this multi-dimensional problem, it keeps morphing and changing constantly like Heraclitus' river. To address and mitigate these low probability but high impactful events, such as remote monitoring tools installing backdoors for APT29 with SolarWinds Orion, or distributing ransomware for Revil with Kaseya's VSA software, we need to teach ourselves how to ask the right questions and how to question the boardroom asks. Because uh, the boardroom doesn't know what questions to ask, actually. Uh, and of course, these are all difficult questions with no easy answers, I'm afraid. But to not address them would likely obviate some potential paths to their resolution. And so to ensure that the risk is identified and mitigated at all levels of the org chart, we just need to transform ourselves, I think, from technology evangelists into risk evangelists and to think more about risk in an abstract fashion and not so much about CVSS scores and CVEs, but about risk and cognitive risk. And to conclude, um, a quote that I'd like to share from one of my colleagues or former colleagues, Greg Wood, who was the SVP um, at Disney, uh, he said, as managers, we execute a plan. And as leaders, we manage scarcity. And as executives, we manage ambiguity. So I worked with Greg when I was the CISO for Marvel. And you don't have to look any further than Disney, I think, to see a really good sustained and responsible innovation looks like. Obviously, they've had some challenges um, of late, and they just got rid of Bob, right? Bob Chapek. Uh, and they brought Bob Iger back in. Um, so apparently, you need to be Bob to be the head of Disney, uh, or at least be named Bob. But hopefully, they find a good succession planning for him um, and uh, continue to you know, grow and evolve this amazing set of assets and resources that they have. Uh, and uh, lastly, here's a, a QR code. Uh, you can point your camera at it. It's not malware. It is just a mail to link uh, to send me an email asking for a copy of this presentation. Uh, if you're interested in some of the links that I talked about or you want to have some of the cool graphics that I used, I'm happy to share that with you all. And with that, I open it up for questions. Mike, that was a fantastic presentation. I appreciate all your time on that one. Uh, since, as you know, I was moving from a car to my uh, home office. If you wouldn't mind just right clicking on my uh, item here and, and give me uh, host access again, I can at least get the recording and any questions that we have in the Q and A uh, asked. Um, I do Indeed. have a, I do have a question that I would like to present uh, in reference to um, tools like this in general, um, but we really speak about false positives and deception technology. Uh, a lot of organizations do put in place. Uh, technologies. They might change banners on purpose. They might put in uh, deception tools uh, or honeypots.